So, if taxation and the problems of our country were not enough to depress you, tonight I'm going to talk to you about getting older. <laughs> Aren't you sorry you came out? <laughs> Afterwards there will be alcohol. <laughs> at a small fee. But first, I think it's important that we um, pause and reflect for a moment on the lessons that were learned uh, over the weekend, um, certainly by some of us. <laughs> I thought that this meme could be improved. <laughs> we could do with all the help we can get out there at the moment. But onto the subject of tonight's presentations, you'll see that this is 50 shades of grey with a small g and an e, not an a. Um, the other grey is uh, in a different part of Amazon.com and is an entirely different book. This one, unfortunately, is becoming closer and closer to my heart as a subject um, because, unfortunately, it is starting to come uh, to that point that I can't deny that I am getting older. And if you, indeed, have not yet said these words yourselves, probably to your children, you have certainly heard them. Um, the problem, of course, with this is that by the time we actually do understand, it's usually too late to apply the lesson to which the person is referring. But age does come to us all. And the good news is, and if there is any good news about aging, it is this, it is that we will all live a lot longer. But it's not all bad, because uh, a lot of folks have enjoyed great success later in life. So Samuel L. Jackson, who seems to be in every movie, actually only started serious acting when he was 43. He washed dishes before that. Uh, Julia Child, for those who remember her, she started her TV career at 50, became the first world-famous chef. Today we're so used to those, we forget that she was a bit of a groundbreaker in her day. Ray Kroc, uh, who was an early adopter of the tanning machine, as you can see, um, <laughs> Also franchised McDonald's <laughs> burger shops. And he started at 52, where Colonel Saunders started his KFC shops at 62. So it's not all bad. And in fact, even the inventor of the vacuum cleaner was 59 when his vacuum cleaner was bought by Hoover himself. So the question I have then is, if we know that investments and people both become more valuable the longer they're around, why is it that ageism <coughs> is the only acceptable ism? these days. Because all the others have fallen out of favor. But somehow we believe that older folks are somehow worth less or are not worth having around. And the thing is, is that we all have a great interest in this, fighting that perception, because it is the one ism that's going to apply to all of us. Because you may not be black, you may not be gay, you may not be all sorts of things, but you will one day be old, God willing, unless you drink too much or indulge in any of the other behaviors that Socrates would have disapproved of. <laughs> so we live significantly longer. We live significantly longer than our prehistoric relatives who only live to 30. And it's an astonishingly short life. But what we forget about this is that that is an average. And averages are the work of the devil. And it doesn't mean that when people in prehistoric times hit 30, they died or were eaten by something. It was, in fact, an average because the childhood mortality was so high. And it's childhood mortality that's improved so much and has improved life expectancy. It's improved dramatically in recent times, in fact. This graph goes back just to 1960, and you can see that from 1960 to 2015, it went from 52 to 72. I mean, this is an incredible jump in a very short period of time. If we roll back a little bit further than that, it's even more interesting, and you'll see that if you lived in South Korea or India in 1919, um, then your life expectancy at birth was only 23. Reflected incredibly poor hygiene conditions, violence, um, and famine, particularly in South Korea. What changed? We learned about hygiene, simple washing your hands, and then the massive decline in war and violence also made a very, very big difference. And then along came medical technology. Unfortunately, of course, the problem was that medical technology came alongside cost. Because each of these advances as you move through time is more and more expensive. So it should be no surprise to you that the longest lived nation today is also a very wealthy nation. And that is, of course, the Japanese. The Japanese are so long lived that if a woman is born today, she can expect to live nearly 88 years. Men, um, a mere 80. Uh, which begs the question, which is always interesting to ask in a room which has couples in it. Why do women live longer than men? 
are there any men brave enough to venture an answer? No, he says. Very good. That's the best answer. It's not right to venture an answer in front of your wife. I had somebody today say, um, because men are stupid, um, I wouldn't go that far, but I would point out that there is actually no good biological reason for it. There's nothing really solid that we can take it down to. But we do know that men generally make stupid decisions. <laughs> For example, Russian men are outlived by their women by 12 years, but they outdrink their women 10 times. There is a correlation between those two things. Bangladeshi women, in contrast, don't live that much longer than men at all. So a huge variation around the world. But back to the serious stuff. So progress has been relentless. And the one thing that we do know is that there's a very strong correlation between wealth and how long you can expect to live. So what this graph does is on the bottom axis, it measures how wealthy you are. So as time goes past, which it will in a moment, you'll see that as you get wealthier, you also live longer. So what you can expect of the dots, and essentially these are countries grouped into sub-regions, and I've just grouped them together <coughs> by major geographic regions, is you'll see that as everyone gets wealthier, they also live longer. But of course, not everybody lives equally long or is equally wealthy. So you'd expect the graph to have a slope. And indeed, if you look over time, it does develop that. Now, as you can see, Europe and the Americas started to advance much before Africa and Asia. But look very importantly at what happened in about 1919 to the data, when the whole world suffered a dip. Watch, and there you saw it. And again, in 1945, a big dip in life expectancy around the world. Watch now as Asia starts to enter into the modern world, particularly post the 80s, and it starts to accelerate as China and Southeast Asia move into modern world. And you have the curve that we have today. So sadly, Africa down here with countries like Niger, which has a life expectancy of 15 years at birth, right up here to our friends in Japan at 87 years. Hmm. That's possibly not the outcome we wanted for that. Uh -huh. Okay, we're back. So, what changed? First question, what happened in 1919? World War. What else? Very important question there. What happened in 1945? World War. Right. Now, the thing is, is that you would have noticed that the 1919 dip was a lot bigger than the 1945 dip. But actually, we lost about the same proportion of people. But what we did was, is we lost a lot more youngsters in 1919. So here you have life expectancy for a 70-year-old, and here for a newborn, and for a range of cohorts in between. And you can see that in 1919, it was actually the younger folks that suffered more. But this was war. Surely that shouldn't be so. But it was actually a very big difference between 1919 and 1945. And that was the Spanish flu. So the Spanish flu affected the young disproportionately heavily. And that's quite simply because if you were a little older, you had likely been exposed to the Russian flu in the late 1800s and had developed an immunity to flu, at least in part. The two things to take out of this. One, flu is a killer. 2013 also saw a dip in life expectancy around the world because of flu. And two, vaccination does indeed work. The other thing that we can see is that there's quite a big change here, and that's the tobacco awareness campaign, which came, and I'll show you that in a moment. Something interesting about vaccination is that people tend to focus on the headlines, and so there's been a huge amount of interest around vaccination for Ebola. But actually, if you travel in Africa today, your biggest risk is actually being exposed to measles because our vaccination efforts, thanks to violence and in some places thanks to campaigns, have fallen so drastically that people are dying of measles much more frequently than they used to. And in fact, more people now die of measles than died of Ebola. So we're focusing on the wrong things. The tobacco awareness campaign there actually led to a massive improvement, particularly in the health of the youngsters, because obviously mothers stopped smoking early in pregnancy. Amazing that that period 
started in 1951 and continues even today. So, 50 is the new 40. I tell myself that now as much as I used to tell myself 40 is the new 30. I'm waiting for the next 10 years to come along. But we're all getting older. So, the most important thing today we know, however, is wealth. Because around the world, pretty much hygiene is becoming a standard in the first world and much of the developing world. Wealth makes such a difference that even inside one country, even inside one city, even along one railroad track, you have a massive difference in life expectancy. This is a small part of Chicago, and Streeterville and Englewood are separated by just 15 kilometers, but by 30 years in life expectancy. And the only difference between the two of them is median income. And it makes a difference because it induces violence, poverty, and causes poor housing. It's an incredible difference. It's the biggest difference in America and one of the biggest differences in the world. So, to the individual then. What causes aging? So there are three basic yes. Life is unfortunately the short answer. <laughs> Pretty much sucks, doesn't it? But there are three groups of processes, and we'll focus on, um, on just one of them for the purposes of today. And it happens inside our cells. And this has to do with how our cells reproduce and are sustained. Now, every living organism that is something like us, and that's all the way from roundworms all the way up to us, has a bit of DNA called DAF2. And that particular gene codes for a doorway. And that doorway allows two things into your, your cells. One is IGF-1, which is growth hormone, and the other one is insulin. And those two things between them, as you might expect from their names, allow you to grow and repair, and the other to change food into fuel, which is great, except there's a byproduct. So it's a little bit like driving down the road. Your car has an exhaust pipe, and unless it's a Tesla, there's nasty stuff coming out the end of that. And so we have things like oxidants, for example, that come through into our bodies, and that causes aging. It's one of the processes. So we've discovered by accident that if that gene is damaged, that we live significantly longer. So if we only have half as much insulin and half as much growth hormone coming through, people live quite a bit longer. Except it's not people we're talking about. It's roundworms. So roundworms, <laughs> poor things, first of all they're round and they're worms, they live for only two weeks. Now, if you damage their genes such that they're only getting half the IGF and half the insulin, they live for four weeks. And it's a good four weeks. The proportion of their life that is in old age is in fact pretty much proportionate to what it would have been had they only lived for two weeks. So they have a really good long life. It does make dating very complex for roundworms because when they tell you that they're only two weeks old, you can't really believe them. They might actually be lying on that Tinder profile. Be that as it may, what can we influence? Well, we know that that gene slows aging, but we also know that in the presence of that gene, that protein switches on and that helps repair damage. Now that protein we could perhaps do something about. Interestingly though, although we can't damage the genes of children in the hopes of making them live longer because we don't know what else might happen, growing an extra leg might be a negative, the fact that we can actually ex imitate that effect has been known since the 2000s. How do we imitate it? Starvation. You can see why this has not been a popular dieting option. We would far rather cut out something and pretend that it doesn't all matter. Unfortunately, the only way to live longer by changing what you eat, that's proved by science today, is by starving. It makes for much, much long-lived, many long-lived mice, but all of them are utterly miserable in their little mice cages. So, that's not been a popular option, but we do know that there are things we can do here. Now, there's good news and there's bad news. The good news is there are options. The bad news is they're all expensive and none of them have been proved to work in humans yet. Rapamycin is a molecule that is owned by Novartis. And it sounds like I'm making it up, but it's absolutely true. It's found in only one place in the world, Easter Island. 
It comes from a fungus and it does extend life. Particularly, once again, roundworms. Those little guys get all the good stuff. <laughs> Humans, no luck in human trials yet. What does work to extend your life, however, is metformin. Metformin is a drug that's used to, disease, to, to treat both insulin dependence and transplants. It helps suppress your immune system. Now that's a good thing if you have diabetes or you've had an organ transplant. But for the rest of us, it's not such good news because you live a bit longer, but you permanently have a cold. So also not really a great option. Finally, one other option that has been discovered is that people are naturally prone either to excitation or to rest. So you've got those folks in the world who like to watch Netflix while they have their iPad open and they're talking to their mum. Then you have the others that are asleep on the couch. The ones asleep on the couch are going to live a lot longer. It's completely logical. We now know, however, that it's related to that particular genetic factor. And of course, with a bit of humor coming from science, R-E-S-T, rest, is what it's called. We're now trying to figure out how to switch that on. The problem is, none of these are at Wellness Warehouse yet. So if you are going to Wellness Warehouse, anyone from Wellness Warehouse here? I'm waiting for that day. Anybody going to Wellness Warehouse and buying stuff in little brown bottles? It's not working. It's not helping you. It might make you feel better. It's not helping you live any longer. Anyone else here love, love cranberries as much as I do? Right? You eat them because they have antioxidants. Right, Michael? Antioxidants? It's not helping. It's not helping. Why? You have to eat them fresh. And if you're eating them from Woolworths, they've got so much sugar on, you're going to die of diabetes. <laughs> Especially if you eat enough to help you with the antioxidants. The bigger problem is, is the increases that we all face for healthcare are actually quite staggering. Because everything we've done so far has been pretty much the cheapest things we could do. The growth rate in medical costs is going to double in the next couple of years. And that in part is because we're starting to deal with things like dementia, which are very expensive to deal with, and where there have been no advances for a number of years. And we all know how those prices tend to work. So 100 million cases expected by 2037, and right now today, a new case is diagnosed every 3.2 seconds. Because as we live longer, the things that used to kill us aren't, but new things are coming along. I told you it was going to be a cheerful presentation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're going to move on to the alcohol quite soon. <clears throat> the other news, and there is good news in this, is that sometimes we think, you know, life would be better if, for example, I was living in the U.S. and I had access to their wonderful healthcare system. Well, they spend a ton of money on healthcare. In fact, they spend 200 times more than Pakistan does, but they only live 20% longer. So it's incredible, isn't it? They don't spend, they get value for money in any way, shape, or form. Because if you want to be miserable, think about South Africa. We spend six times as much as Pakistan, and we live less than the Pakistanis do. But anyway, back to the alcohol. <laughs> You could be higher in the US, where a quarter of your health spending is actually completely wasted. A mammogram, for example, costs four times what it does in South Africa, in the USA. Drugs in the USA versus Canada and the United Kingdom are anything from four to ten times as expensive. That's the top eight prescribed drugs in those three countries. And the US is the dark blue line. And these are just multiple. So in other words, it gives you a sense of the proportion of the drug cost. Why should that be so? Well, I'll tell you the story in a very simple example. There is a drug which is available around the world today which can prevent HIV transmission. You take it. If you're exposed to HIV, there's a 90% chance you will not contract HIV. It's called Truvada, and it's made by a company called Gilead. Now, if you want to buy that in South Africa, it costs you 600 Rand a month to buy the generic version, which is paid for by discovery. So it costs you nothing. It's a prescribed medical benefit. Why does it work that way? Our government said to medical aids, there are some things you have to pay for. This is one of them. We don't care what your plan says, you will pay for this. And they said to the drug company, if you would like to sell this in our country, 
you will make a generic available. That's not the case in the US, where the same drug will cost you, are you ready for this, $800 a month, and £1,100 in the UK, and you can't get it freely, you have to be part of a drug trial. The free market, we're better off in this way, at any rate. So the free market, well, it's very expensive when it comes to drugs. Very, very expensive indeed. The problem, of course, is that ultimately we are going to pay these costs. So you are a private patient in South Africa, not a public patient. The situation for a public patient is obviously very different. The overall message, though, is that ageing is just like climate change. We want a technological solution. We don't want to hear that smoked meat is bad for us. We just want a better drug for bowel cancer. We don't want to stop driving our cars. We want somebody to invent a ship that pops up ice cubes and chills the world. It's the same thing with our health. We know what will help us live longer. It's not eating so much. If you look at the mortality statistics, Mexico, for example, loses four years of life expectancy on average per person to obesity. And this is one place where you will find South Africa on a graph in The Economist. Unfortunately, it's not the graph you want to be on. So what does this mean for retirement? Well, basically, if you haven't retired yet, here's the good news. You're never going to retire. You're going to work till you're dead. You're going to be late for your own funeral, and this is why. In the old days, 75 and up, these folks had a pension, which was paid for by taxes or by a defined benefit pension fund in the company. The future looks like this. There's not just lots of 75 year olds, there's lots of everything else year olds, all the way up to 120 year olds. And there is not enough of a tax base because these folks here didn't have enough babies when they were down here. That's the reality. The world is not having enough babies. Did you think we had this problem? Are you going to go home and do something about it? <laughs> it's all up to you. <laughs> what are you telling me about retirement, Mike? <laughs> I don't want to know that. The other thing is, is that whether you're retired, retiring, planning to retire, or just starting to save, your expectations need to change in terms of how much you can earn from your portfolio. Mike spoke about it earlier, but around the world interest rates have come down so dramatically that a risk-free rate is now zero. It used to be 5 to 9 percent. You just can't get that anymore. And Schroeder's did an interesting survey. They asked people, what do you think your portfolio, regular portfolio for somebody who is saving for retirement, what do you think your portfolio is going to deliver you over the next five years from this point? And about a third of people said between 5 and 9%. If you think that in the developed world, inflation is effectively zero, they're saying that after inflation, they'll get 5 to 9%. That seems reasonable to me. These folks are a little depressed, and these folks live in England. <laughs> these folks here are turning retirement into a race between bankruptcy and death. You don't want to be there. These folks need to adjust their expectations down into this sort of area here, whether they're saving or they're drawing an income. Because unfortunately we know what happens, we can see it in the numbers and the people. Baby boomers are going bust. In fact, they're going bust six times faster since 1991. Part of this, of course, is 2008. People got into trouble, either their kids came home and continued to live with them, or they, their own pension funds went under as companies went under. What is this going to mean? Sorry, more bad news. Michael was right. Taxes are going to grow up because this is not sustainable. The country cannot have people falling into poverty in their old age. It's simply not a sustainable social model. And there's a lot of room, at least in the developed world, for taxes to rise. The story in the US is absolutely ridiculous. You cannot drop taxes like that and expect the system to sustain itself going forward. Certainly from a personal tax perspective, I wouldn't like to see taxes go back to that, but in the US for them to be 37% is a little low if you compare it to the Nordics. What about the working world? Well, interestingly, if you have a problem like Japan does, too few babies, 
lots of older folks living longer and longer, you have a couple of busts happening. And the biggest bust there is their property market. One in seven homes is now empty. There's even a, a word for it. And I'm sorry, I forgot to look it up between this afternoon and now. Um, it starts with a K. And it's for homes that will never be occupied again. And there's a bunch of them. Eight and a half million of them in Japan. And that's because they have more deaths than births every year. Nearly half a million per annum. Their population now has been shrinking for a decade. If it continues at this rate, by 2100 there will be half as many Japanese in Japan as there are today. Half as many. Overpopulation is not the problem there. Their Prime Minister actually made a campaign promise to keep the population, currently 127 million, at 100 million. I think that's a big promise for just one man, who is 65, <laughs> I might add. The Japanese are very, very, very potent people, I noticed, in the World Cup, but I'm not sure that even he could do that. Just an interesting anecdote, if you actually look at their workforce, literally, physically look at them, they look different, because 33% of construction workers, for example, are 55%, 55 years or older. This is doing the physical construction. So actually looking at their workforce, it does look different. And at the moment, they allow in 500,000 immigrants a year, but even that soon won't be enough, especially since most of them don't settle in Japan. They basically come and work and leave. So what are the options? Well, it's immigration, as I say, and the, there's another two nations that could do with it, and they're the next two oldest large nations, and that's Italy and Greece. And where, of course, is the biggest backlash against immigrants? Pretty much Italy and Greece. So it's an irony that the one thing that could help them get out of the labor hole that they're very quickly digging is the one thing that is not possible. There's another way to do it, though. It's a lot quicker than making babies, even if it's not as much fun. And that's women in the workforce, making it easier for them to enter, to stay, and to return after having children. If you look, for example, at Japan, Japan's participation rate for women is just above both the US and the OECD average. Now, the US allows immigration, which balances the books, but if Japan was just to move to the Finnish number, I would have liked them to go all the way to Iceland, but let's not get silly, but you'd add 16 million people overnight. Now, you can't make kids fast enough to make 16 million of them, and it's going to take you 25 years before they're any good. Because anyone with kids knows they keep coming home and wanting food and laundry. It takes a very long time, rather just get women back into the workforce. The thing is as well is that everywhere people are simply working longer. There are a number of reasons for this. Part of it is sometimes it's necessity. People just don't have enough money and they have to return to work. But there is also an increasing recognition that a 60-year-old today, a 70-year-old today is not the same as 10 years ago. As individuals, we tend to look at our last example, which is generally somebody who is decades, young, decades older than us. It's not the right thing to look at. Look at your peers. Somebody who is 60 today while you are 50. Somebody who is 70 today when you are 60. And you will notice immediately they are more vital, more able to participate, more willing to learn and change than generations ago. Um, of course, there's also other reasons. My father retired at 60, uh, went home, was banned to the garage quite quickly. And even so, two years later, my mother sat him down and said, Donald, I married you for breakfast and for supper, but not for lunch. <laughs> and she sent him back to work. Thank goodness, because otherwise we would have had a nasty murder case on our hands. We're not sure who would have killed who, but it was going to happen. Most people don't really want to retire early. They certainly don't want to do so almost immediately after they've done it. Because three months in, and you're pretty much bored. And we've, what we've seen with the numbers, that's 2019 there, 1992 back there. So these numbers are real. These ones are forecast. You can see that people return quite quickly to work post-2008. But that trend has continued and probably will for some time yet. We think that is because it's become... Um, quite obvious that you, uh, you are retiring too early at 60. Even 65 to 69, we believe, will start to return to work much more sharply because, again, advances in medical science and socially just mean it's worth continuing to work. The question then is, if the world is all about technology and new skills, will the older worker actually cope? 
And the answer unequivocally is yes, because the nature of work is changing. I'll speak for a moment about technology, but just as one example, we had time with a, a gerontologist from uh, Oxford University, Professor Harper, and she pointed out to us that as the world grows older, we will need more and more people in the caring and empathetic professions. Because the one thing a robot can't do for you is provide company. It cannot provide comfort and solace and care. And so the way that we value those professions and the way in which people uh, change their careers over time will start to accommodate this. What else will change? I think some things will be very familiar to South Africans, and that's the sandwich generation is uh, one example. These two folks here, sandwiched between their kids and their parents. Multi-generational households. It's been a thing in South Africa for decades, I think, and, but it's been interesting to see that it's increased very rapidly in the UK and has been increasing for a long time in the US as generations live together in one home. It's important to acknowledge that it's usually this person here who foregoes a career outside the home and gives up, in a sense, that wage. The cost of that just in the US is half a trillion dollars a year. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of work that goes unpaid and sometimes, I suppose, unacknowledged. What do we get in return for it? Well, it's important to understand that intergenerational wealth transfer is not all about the rands and the cents, the dollars and the pounds. It sometimes is also just about the value of having older relatives around, the, the comfort of having a grandparent to hand. If you don't have one, you can rent one <laughs> if you're in France. This is a business in France called Set Famille, My Family, which puts together the elderly that have no relatives with youngsters who have no elderly. Now you can imagine that normally that would open the door to all sorts of problems. But what you have essentially here is a social service which puts itself between those two parties. One needs money, the other one needs company. You put those things together, it's an instant family. They've been doing it now for three years, and in that time they've put together a thousand families. And in the research that I've done, the one thing that I have come to the conclusion is that loneliness is a killer. It's a terrible scourge, particularly in countries like Japan. And this is a fantastic solution. So every time you think to yourself, honestly, I don't know what the future of work will be. I don't know how people are going to make money. I don't know what my kids will do. Never underestimate how incredibly, incredibly innovative human beings are. He's off to go and volunteer his services. <laughs> do it for your kids, sir. <laughs> what else will change? Robots will be everywhere, but they are not going to look like you think. They're not going to be all independent and autonomous. Many of the robots will in fact be things that we call cobots, things that we cooperate with. And this is an extreme example. It's a $100 million complete exoskeleton from MIT laboratories. Uh, but what you should be thinking of instead is what mobile phones were when they first started and what they've ended up looking like today. Ubiquitous in everyone's pocket and relatively cheap, unless you like Apple. Imagine for a moment just the arm section of this helping somebody who'd had a stroke, as an example. That's the kind of thing that's going to change uh, the way that we live in the future, being, making it possible for us to live independently for longer. And that living independently for longer is the gold standard. It's called aging in place. We all know that having somebody live in their own home as long as possible is the healthiest option for them. And sometimes that's not possible because of their health. And it's often something as simple as dementia that will upend that. And dementia is a particularly cruel illness because it robs you of your memories. Sometimes of people, sometimes of things. But, as with most of these things, there's an app for that. And that app is How Do I? Now, How Do I? very simply pairs your phone with the object. All you have to do is point your phone at the object, triggers a video, which will explain to you exactly what that thing is. And it makes it possible for you to live independently for longer. It's an incredibly simple and efficacious way to make this happen. If you think, well, old folks aren't going to do that, well, I've got news for you as an old folk. WeChat's fastest adopters, that's WhatsApp in China, is the over 55 cohort. 
They've been adopting faster than anybody else. They're online all the time. They're also shopping online. What's interesting is the most pop sorry, pop popular future feature on uh, Tabo is also to do with online shopping. Tabo is uh, a little bit like Snapchat. Uh, sorry, not Snapchat, PayPal and Snapscan. And Tabo has just added a feature called Pay For Me. And it allows you and your grandchildren to link your payment phone, your payment system on your phone. And if they're shopping online or happen to be looking at something in the shop and they scan it, they can go, hey, Grand, do you want to pay for this for me? <laughs> it's a very popular feature, and I hate to break it to you. It's coming your way. <laughs> Brace yourselves. In conclusion, there's some interesting roadblocks to this whole process. So as one question, what percentage of people who could benefit from a hearing aid do you think actually get one? Guesses. 10%? 5% is closer. It's actually two. And in my own family, once again, um, and they hate this, but they all get used, um, there's a very good example. We are all deaf. It's congenital through the whole family. My sister was born deaf. She had an operation. Now she just pretends to be deaf. Um, my brother is completely deaf. It's utterly useless in any situation, um, particularly social situations. My mother was deaf, and unfortunately so was my father. Of all of us, only my brother has two perfectly useless hearing aids. Why? Because we all would have benefited. Because... Products like that are the three dreaded Bs. Big, beige, and boring. Nobody wants them. And so people avoid them. And you've got to get around that in some way or another. And here's one. That percentage that I pointed out about hearing aids is almost as true for call buttons. So if somebody falls in a, a nursing home, for example, even if they have a call button around their neck, their call percentage is only 10%. So they only look for help 10% of the time. And it turns what was a simple fall into a blood clot and a stroke in a very short space of time. What then if you could install a floor in their room or their home that monitored how they walked and with artificial intelligence over time learned this is Anne, this is Joe. And as soon as there was any change, alerted a caretaker. Avoids the fall in the first place. It's amazing what human ingenuity will actually do. And believe it or not, that technology comes from gaming. So if you are getting irritated with your kids sitting on video games, not all the things that come out of it are bad. And it's the same thing with aging. It's actually a process that should be embraced. It's going to come to us all, and thank goodness you've prepared yourselves well for it, simply by being here tonight. So thank you very much for your time and your attention. I do appreciate it. Thank you.